today I want to talk about Internet Explorer 10, in specific about the mobile version. Uh, there are a number of uh, improvements that come in this version of uh, Internet Explorer 10. I won't have time to talk about everything. Uh, app cache, uh, blobs, uh, history API are all things that we expect from modern uh, web browsers. Uh, today I'm going to focus on some things that are specific to IE10 where uh, they are standards compliant but, but very advanced. And some other things that we expect from, from every uh, web browser, especially from mobile. Uh, I want to start from uh, forms. Um, HTML5 brings a, a number of improvement to forms. Uh, they are backwards compatible. Uh, when they designed HTML5 for forms, uh, they, they introduced a number of attributes and new uh, tags that help create forms that are easier uh, to fill for the user and easier to validate for the developer. Uh, the improved usability comes, for example, when you can uh, enter a number or an email address automatically and, and when you have a virtual keyboard like on Windows Phone or on iPhone and Android, you get the correct uh, keypad to enter the, the correct values. This means that filling the form is going to be less tedious for your users and um, uh, it's going to be easier for you to validate because you have, you're going to have pseudo classes. Uh, I'm going to show you something uh, in CSS that makes it easier for the user to see that the value is correct and basically stops uh, the submission of the, of the data uh, before it's even uh, uh, delivered to the server side. Uh, some of the things that have been added, uh, some of them have been picked up from WAP specification, like the ability to enter a phone number, to force the user to enter a phone number or an email address. Other things are, are modern. They've been added now, like progress, the ability to define a range, and to move up and down values. Um, HTML5 forms are actually pretty well supported across the major browsers like Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer 10. This is a table that I created where actually the support is pretty spotty. Uh, we can see it's a yes and no all over the place. Uh, one good thing, one thing that I want to highlight is that uh, the way that HTML5 forms have been designed uh, basically give no excuse to the developer not to implement these things. All the new tags and attributes are actually have a very good fallback. So if you require, for example, a field to use a number or an email, if the browser doesn't support the attribute, it just falls back to the default input mode. So uh, even though these things are not very well supported, for example, you should use them. You can use them uh, with, with very limited downside for the user and pretty much zero downside for you. Uh, I have a little asterisk on the step up and step down uh, for Internet Explorer. The step up and step down are two events for JavaScript that allow you, uh, when you have an input field, let's say that you have a number field and you want to have any number from 1 to 10, uh, step up and step down allow you to create, for example, a button, a button and then with JavaScript increment or decrement uh, automatically the value. Um, in Internet Explorer 10, it works but it only works when you're using a type range. Type range is a new type introduced uh, um, with HTML5. If you're using a type number or a type date, basically the step up and down won't do anything. This, to me, is a partial implementation because the specification doesn't say anything about it, uh, but this is how um, Microsoft implemented it so far. Um, I have a couple of screenshots that I took on, on my uh, Nokia device. And uh, I want to show you how HTML5 uh, works. Work. For example, so we have a new field, a new attribute called placeholder. Allows me, for example, in the first field to write John Doe as the suggested first and last name for the user. Or I have an example email address in the second field. Um, these are placeholders. You know, they remove the need for you to use JavaScript to enter the value, remove it when the user selects it. It's uh, it's basically instantaneous and it requires uh, just a couple bytes of code. Um, and it has no uh, downside if, if the browser doesn't support it. You can see that some of the fields are um, surrounded by a red color or a green color. Uh, these are the pseudo classes that I was talking about earlier. These are classes that you can use in CSS. Uh, you can use, for example, column required, column valid. 
And based on the input that has been entered so far by the user, uh, if it has filled, if the user has filled the field or not, uh, the, um, the color will change based on the rules that I specified in CSS. So the first three fields in my case are required. Until the user has entered the values, they will be red. Um, for the, the following ones, they, I mark them as optional, so they are green because there's no minimum requirement. The second screenshot, uh, shows you how I required a phone number. There's the placeholder in the first screenshot. In the second one, you can see that once the user has selected it, uh, the num numeric keypad came, comes up. So the user is automatically forced to enter a number, and most of all, it's a lot easier because he can just type away. Um, these are some of the things that you can do with HTML5. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can also specify a pattern. So for the number, for example, you could say it needs to be a US phone number with a plus at the beginning. It needs to be 11 digits. Uh, you, if you know the country where the phone number is required and you know the format, you could specify the format, and the browser will do the validation. The patterns are a simple regular expression, so you could say digits or letters, uh, whatever you need. Um, these are some of the uh, improvements that come with HTML5, and as mentioned, really you should use them because there's no uh, downside. There, everything falls back to the default implementation of the um, input field, so they work really well, and they are supported across most browsers. The second thing that I want to talk about today is web performance. W3C has a working group called Web Performance. They are uh, writing a number of specifications. Uh, the navigation timing is the most uh, advanced in status. Uh, it's uh, nearly a recommendation, I think. And performance timeline and resource timing are both currently in draft, so they're still being worked on. Um, these are all implemented in Internet Explorer. There's also page visibility, which is another API that allows you to be aware if the page is visible to the user, something very useful. You might not want to fire a JavaScript event if the page is in background and there's no need to update data. Uh, there are a couple of other events, um, like request animation frame and set immediate. Uh, these are very useful for you to know um, to define callbacks for the browser to notify uh, your code when the browser is ready to uh, paint a new page or is done uh, painting a page so that you can fire your, your own event. Uh, this is uh, much better than uh, the set timer because um, it allows the browser to notify the developer when is the right time to run your code. And that saves battery, saves network, and saves CPU cycles. So it makes your page faster. We all want to be fast, and we all want to have our pages load fast, load quickly, and we need to know um, how quickly the page loaded. The Navigation Timing API is the first one that I'm going to talk about, and this is implemented in Firefox, uh, Chrome, and Internet Explorer. So you have very good support across the browser. It's not implemented in Safari. It's not implemented in iOS 6. Uh, this API gives you access to information about how long the page took to load. Uh, it gives you a lot more information than simply the onload event, because you have access to everything, basically from uh, when the navigation started. It's, it's a little bit cut up there. Navigation start is the very first time when the user basically clicked on the link. You can see the information about redirection, DNS resolution, TCP, when the request was made, how long the server took to respond to, the, to your request. So it gives you a lot of detail. Uh, about how long it took to load the page, as opposed to uh, the onload event that basically is only the last bit. So this is a lot better for you to know uh, how long it took to load your page and all the resources. This timing includes everything that composes the page, so JavaScript, CSS files, or images that were required for loading the page. Um, something that you should note is that if you try to access this information, uh, when the onload event is fired, you will basically happen to be around, well, sometime between the load event start and load event end, depending how many uh, operations you have in between. So you might not have all the information that is available at a later stage. 
This is how you use uh, the API. The first line, of course, I'm um, detecting if the browser supports the window dot performance. Performance is the new object that is part of the uh, specification. And everything that is part of navigation timing is under the performance object. Uh, in my case, I'm using uh, timing. Of course, I'm picking up timing, which is the object within performance that gives me the timing information. And then I'm, I'm simply calculating how long it took to load the page. This is the simplest use case. Uh, you could go into more detail to try to understand, you know, which event took a long time. Uh, during my experiments, I was looking at, for example, redirection, how long redirects took. Um, so there's a lot of talk, you know, if, if, if your um, link was followed from Twitter, t.co, bit.ly, some other uh, service in between, uh, you will get all this information using the uh, this API, you will know exactly how long uh, the browser spent to follow all the redirects, maybe multiple. Resource timing and performance timeline are the two new specifications. These are only implemented right now in Internet Explorer 10, but they are coming to Chrome and Firefox very soon. Um, there was a workshop recently uh, in the Bay Area, and basically all the browser vendors committed to implementing these new uh, APIs. Similar to the navigation timing, the resource timing gives you um, a breakdown of all the events that happened for the browser to load the content. Uh, but in this case, it's for every single resource that composes the page. So the performance timeline tells you exactly uh, which files were loaded when, in which order, and then resource timing gives you access to the loading of each of these elements. Again, you have access to redirect uh, app cache, because some of the files might have been in, in the local cache, DNS, TCP, and the request and response. Uh, this way, you have a much better view of, of uh, all the details for the network, for the browser to request the, the files either on the network or locally. Uh, similarly to uh, the other API, it's under performance. It's, um, in this case, I'm using the method get entries. There are other met methods that are part of performance timeline. Get entries is one. Get entries by type is another. Uh, each entry uh, in the performance timeline, timeline has a different type. It could be an image. It could be a CSS file. It could be um, a third-party file that is loaded by a JavaScript. You have access to this type of information. In this case, I'm simply running a loop, uh, loading each uh, of the entries and reading uh, the information. Again, just simply how long it took to load the file. Uh, you could filter down by images or CSS scripts. Uh, something that you should note is that for privacy reasons, the working group decided that some of the information about the files that the browser loaded might not be available to you. For example, you might not have access to the URL uh, of the file. Uh, for most files like an image or a CSS, uh, you will have the field name that you can see here in this example. That one will give you the URL to the image or to the CSS script. Let's say that you have um, a Facebook button or you have some service that is loading, for example, images that might be private to the user. Uh, you will not have access to that information. You will know that a file was loaded, how long it took, but you will not know what file that was. So you need to, uh, you need to pay attention to that uh, when, you're, when you're trying to build uh, some stati statistics or analytics, for example, on how long it took to load your page. Um, these APIs are very useful for, uh, for example, what is called real user uh, measurement, so knowing exactly how long it took for each user uh, to load your pages and your content. You can build, of course, aggregated data. Uh, there are a couple of um, open source libraries. One is called Boomerang, one is called Sessions. Uh, you can download those, you can use them. There are two or three companies already uh, using this type of uh, APIs for measuring. And you can, if you use Google Analytics, uh, there's a section called page speed that is usually showing the data from the navigation timing API. So these APIs are already out in the wild. They are available on Windows 8, on Windows Phone 8 for the performance timeline and navigation and resource timing. Navigation timing is available pretty much everywhere. Um, I'm going to move on to another topic. I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit fast. We only have 30 minutes in total, and I wanted to cover a lot. I will have a lot of uh, links at the end of the presentation, and of course, if you have any questions, they are welcome. The next topic uh, for me is IndexedDB. 
uh, IndexedDB is implemented in many browsers, uh, Chrome, Firefox, and IE10. In Chrome and Firefox, only the latest versions, uh, respectively 24 and 16, have the support for the unprefixed version. Uh, previous versions and IE10 all supported only uh, prefixed. You might have heard about WebSQL. WebSQL was the previous standard that the W3C was working on. The group